welcome. I'm going to get you to, through six misconceptions. We are not here to praise Scrum or to praise Kanban or to say that one is better than the other. For sure, none of that. The topic of this webinar, it really came to be because since 2000, uh, 2020, I honestly I have been encountering a lot of teams that just say, Scrum's too heavy, you know, all oh, Scrum, so many meetings. We are more of a Kanban team anyway. It is a, a rather interesting statement for sure. So we started analyzing what seemed to draw these teams to Kanban, I'm trying to really help them. For the most part, it was really rather shocking that they wanted some sort of easy way out, not because they're mean or anything, but they, they're just not comfortable with Scrum. Uh, and they thought that Kanban was the next easiest thing. So if I would really summarize what people seem to think of Kanban sometimes is this one-liner clunky board in an ad hoc mindset, which is a huge, huge disservice to Kanban. And it is a missed opportunity for work effectiveness as well, because Kanban is exactly that work effectiveness, work in flow. Okay, so uh, let's get started with looking at the misconceptions. Number one, too many meetings. That's a common one, especially the daily. I don't know what happens with the daily, the daily scrum or the daily stand up. I depicted it here with a little heart because I like to think of the cadences as the rhythm and no better rhythm than a heartbeat. I often say to people, would you like your heart to skip a beat? I don't think so. The name of that is arrhythmia. Nobody likes those. So cadences, honestly, uh, if you want to call them meetings by all means, but the cadences are really important for the rhythm, for the team, for the process and, and the workflow. And in Kanban, you actually have seven. So often folks will say, um, we're tired, there are too many meetings in Scrum, and we're talking about four cadences. And then you go in Kanban and you actually have seven. Granted, when teams start with Kanban, they remain with only three. And they will be the famous daily stand-up to make sure we are on track every single day, especially because Kanban is focused on the flow of work. We inspect early and often. We do not skip a day. It's not a every other daily. It's a daily stand-up. Then you have the weekly replenishment meeting. 30 minutes, very common. Sometimes it can go up to an hour. And there we decide what comes next into the committed backlog. The keyword being commit it. And then folks say, you know, how so quick? Well, you have the input here of other six meetings or, or cadences, if you will. So when folks talk that sprint planning need to be something really quick, you see they pushing for an hour max and they mention in Kanban, this is usually short. I think they should think again. They should learn a little bit more. And then you have the bi-weekly service delivery review. That's the one doesn't really require much introduction is you do the work then you have to show it, you have to gather feedback. Then you have extra cadences here. And if you're really talking about Kanban for organizations, you only have the full benefit when you have the seven of them. The delivery planning meeting, it depends on the cadence of whenever you consider that you deliver and delivery really is work at the hands of the client. So you can imagine that you can't always deliver work um, to the clients in the day that it's finished, not only because of technical hardening off, but you might have full launching process or marketing and whatnot. So in the delivery planning, it doesn't really matter. What you do is that you're ensuring a smooth transfer uh, and you're eliminating inefficiencies of work so that it arrives beautifully in the hands of the client. So that's the objective in here. Then you have risk review, self-explanatory. We assess risk on the current work in progress and also look ahead, future work in progress, holistic view happens monthly. Operations review also monthly. You're really looking for uh, internal synergies, if you will. So how can internal teams and systems identify and manage their dependencies and how can those department interconnectedness and how can teams even out their inefficiencies? You know, some teams are for the nature of their work, they need to be slower, others need to go fast, but all of this together represents the process of your delivery. And strategy review, as you can imagine, bird's eye view, it's quarterly roadmap type, really, really big picture. So I'll honestly, I'll say that the biggest reason I think that happens when people complain about the uh, the meetings, you know, too many meetings in Scrum, we prefer Kanban and whatnot. You really have to do with the quality of their meeting. It's sad to say, but 
those meetings will be just as bad in Kanban. Uh, we are talking about meetings that were not properly facilitated by any means. They don't have a clear intention stated. The intention when there is one is not followed through. You have free unstructured discussion. So sometimes someone can just hijack and speak the whole time. The usual suspects only speaking, right? Or a scrum master, which is basically a project manager in disguise, <laughs> kind of telling people what to do. If you have remote meetings, uh, they, they have nothing visual. It's just a bunch of voices, not even um, not even cameras going on. So it's pretty, pretty bad as a quality of meeting. And that's why I put really as a number one, because I, from my investigation and my personal experience, that was really the single hardest misconception that I had to work with my teams for teams that were trying to, you know, we are Kanban team and we want to use Kanban because of that. So I always used to say to them, yeah, you can definitely adopt a healthy lifestyle uh, and you can eat healthy once a month, but you're probably healthier if you eat healthy every day, not every three days or every five days. So really playing with that a little bit. Then our second misconception, you don't really need a scrum master or a team lead or an agile lead, that figure that's really helping us tackle all the issues and really help the team. I would say you don't really need insert your uncomfortable role here because that's basically what they are trying to say. And the, the idea with soccer here, and could have been basically any other game, can you imagine? So in soccer, you have attack and defense, center back, I think, and a quarter, quarterback, and you have uh, center forward and whatnot, striker. Uh, but imagine if folks just entered the field and played in whichever way they feel like it. I'm not convinced that will be a successful game for anyone. And I, that's the point. I mean, roles exist for setting proper boundaries of autonomy. Roles have nothing to do with agile. It's a very important thing to remember. Take waterfall. Project manager, that is a construct of waterfall. It is an accountability that was designed to carry the whole project. It's pretty Herculean, I guess, if you think. You have the project manager interweaving risks, communication, resource allocation, and etc. But it was, you know, a very clear role with a very clear accountability. So I've seen a lot of folks running away from Scrum into Kanban because they did not know what to do with the product owner, basically just gets ordered from people instead of actually really interacting with the client um, or some other folks that don't think they need a Scrum Master. Why do we need one? What I usually say to them, very simple, new ways of working, obviously new roles and accountabilities. The funny thing that seems to, to happen out there is that effective Kanban teams also contain two roles and those roles are very similar to those from Scrum. Maybe you heard service delivery manager is the one responsible for getting work out keep the flow going. And then you have the service request manager, which is the one who makes sure that the new work keeps coming in. It's prioritized, it's organized. Those roles were not mandatory by any means. I'll give you that. But they were a natural evolution in Kanban, actually. They were created from necessity. They are, today, I would say they are really the, the yin to each other's yang. And one thing that I will show you here, maybe you've seen this, maybe you haven't. There is something called a Kanban maturity model. And it has seven, seven levels. Sorry, a mistake here. This is level six, the built for survival. It's the top, like the value grows like this. And pretty consistently, most organizations that want to adopt Kanban, they are still here, level one, level zero, and one. They might think otherwise, but they, they're still struggling. They're still talking about tasks and their vision goes as far as teams, really. And in Kanban, if you're thinking in the KMM, the two roles, the service delivery manager and the service request manager, they shape up a little bit differently. So if you are thinking levels zero and one, which are max at the team level, I, I would say I'll give you that. Honestly, there is not much of an importance to have those roles, those delivery managers, because the work coordination is pretty erratic. There's a lot of heroics going on from the team members. But as a company attempts to be here and call themselves customer centric, customer oriented, uh, fit for purpose and etc., then these roles start to show up pretty heavily. I wouldn't say it's really possible to get there without these roles, because then you really start abandoning project view and you go towards product, service, 
Yeah, you will really need them. And I mean, today does really sound like what all these organizational transformations are trying, right? That's really where they want to go. So they will need those two roles in place. Uh, those two delivery management roles, they will act very differently depending on where you are, in which stage you are. I would say here, when you're customer-centric, customer-oriented, you will need those roles to be focusing first all about the, the identity and the effectiveness of the service and of the product. So there's a huge aspect of creating that. As you go to fit to purpose or fit for purpose, those two positions then they start becoming more about negotiating the commitment point. And what we call the commitment point is when work is really ready to be started and also negotiating risks and the delays that happen after commitment. So that's really where they will be working on. And then in the level four and above, I would say those two roles are really responsible more for the human and the social elements. They will look into organizational feedback loops. They will be connecting business outcomes to operational decisions. We are really talking here, whole business units. You can definitely imagine that you don't hire for, let's say, level two in the same way that you you hire for a level four and further. So I would leave you with that. So if some of you here really like cooking, you know that cooking and baking is not the same thing. Baking requires so much precision, requires so many, like if you need a cake, have a baker <laughs> bake your cakes. So that's really what I was usually telling my teams as far as um, the roles and accountabilities that are specific to frameworks that we adopt. We have this next one here, backlog and prioritization. Well, but our priorities are constantly changing, AKA excuse for lack of focus to just jump from activity to activity and treating work as a, as a checklist, as an output, as opposed to outcome-based and, and folks just think that's Kanban, accept anything at any time. But let's say shifting priorities are, for sure they are a reality in, in daily life and at work. Another reality though, is that context switching is expensive. How do we really reconcile those two? There is no other way around it in the world of Agile. Make small bits of work and then you finish them. You don't change your mind in the middle. So you really have to work the, the usual stuff that you know. There is big work. Break that down like this. You can guarantee the sequence of work, which is so important. Doesn't matter the flavor of Agile. You have to be thinking of those. Small sequential work is the more effective way of working. So it's a funky picture here, but it really is toward that. So the, the idea of start something, stop, switch, stop again, come back, finish, this is not effective. It is against flow. I like to say to my teams, think about a faucet. Open your faucet, close it, open again. Is water flowing? No, there is water coming out, but that is not flow. Flow is a stream, flow is a constant. If you have barriers, if you have impediments, the work is not flowing. Interruptions are like the closed faucet. They are causes of delay. Here, a little monster here. Kanban really is always aiming to reduce delay because part of delighting the customers is not making them wait. But most importantly, even if you think about it, is not making them pay for the time that you are not working on something that you're delivering to them. This is pretty big in Kanban. So those shifting priorities, which are AKA ad hoc, undisciplined ways of treating the customer request or someone else's request in any way, it just can't happen. It really has to stop. In Kanban, you define policies for the intake of new work, as well as policies for committing to new work. Some of the cadences that we saw earlier, they help with that. In Kanban, you have limits for the amount of work that can be in progress, and there are best practices for that. In Kanban, you have classes of work, which are basically categories that help you decide which types of work should be accepted under which circumstances. Kanban is absolutely, I would say, ruthless when you think about the discipline towards the backlog. No slack is possible here. And for those looking for an easy way out, trying to forego a PO and etc. I mean, remember that in Kanban, you will have to have your service request manager in here. Lead time, as we see, is literally how long it takes from the time a customer asks us something and the time they have it in their hands. And it really is depicted like that. And I think every project should be depicted like that. You always start 
red. We like to say the project is good. We're starting, right? There are no blockers. That really isn't how Kanban sees things. It is only green when you reach the hand of the client. So you actually, you always start with the unhappy customer and then have your markers all the way to that happiness. In Kanban, we really, really protect the lead time because when we have a clear and organized backlog, that's really what we're doing. And when we keep on top of the priorities, that really is where we are working on. That's how you are customer oriented in Kanban. The board. I think that is one huge, huge misconception as well. And in my case, I saw this a lot under the, oh, no, it's all fine. It's done. Yeah, I just, I forgot to update the board. How many times have I seen that? The board is not up to date. Oh, do we even need to put this on the board? I, I didn't think so. Okay. Like a corollary of the prioritization piece that we saw in here. The board is at the heart of the practices and the tools of Kanban. Remove that and you have no Kanban. You just destroyed the method. So right there, there is no excuse possible for a messy board, no assignee, poor description, no updates. And we thought the Scrum was too hard. Well, it is impossible really in Kanban. And in fact, in Kanban, I don't know Japanese, but what I know from reading is that the Japanese word for Kanban is actually related to the little cards representing the work. So that is your Kanban. It's not the board and not everything else. It's my work represented in a little card. So I think that speaks for itself. Yeah, you have the little card looks like something like this, but you also visualize everything, the work, the blockers, the people, the dependencies, the policies, the status of our process, the dates, maximum amount of work in progress allowed. I'm sure I didn't list everything. <laughs> and you keep going, you visualize all these things. And honestly, it is all very, very simple and quick to, if you think to build into a buy for it, it just has to become some sort of habit. It really is at the heart of what it is. But yet again, discipline. The board contains all the policies and the stages of our processes. So to do, doing and done, great for personal Kanban, but for the most part, that's really not that great for our work. You want your Kanban columns to be the stages of your process. The real stages, you want to inform what happened once you go from one step to the other. That's really, really important because among many things, you want to understand which stages are quick, effective, which stages are constantly blocked, the ones that take most time. It is definitely one of the main utilities of you being able to visualize how your work flows or doesn't flow. Limiting the work in progress is here, the little blue numbers on top of the board, usually by the stage name, somewhere very visible. Then you have here policies, other sorts of very concise policies, like your definition of done already, something like that, that make things very, very clear for you to work. The card contains a clear description of the task in a form that everybody can understand both the what and the why. So what to do and the value of it, the who, who's doing it, a date when it started, a due date, if this is a specific date in which the work has to be finished. Uh, and those are not just a Ah, I think it will be finished by March. Now, a due date, a fixed date in Kanban means this is a regulatory issue when you know, it enters in vigor on July 1st. That's what we call fixed date in Kanban. It's not because, of, oh, the client wants it to July 1st. No, no, no. Very, very different thing. But yeah, there's a date. There are many dates, if you will. Um, then you have little markers and blockers on the card. No blocker column. It's not a stage of your process. So you don't have a, a blocker column. You want to know that a task itself, a piece of work itself, it's not moving, it's red. Then you walk the board from right to left. You read on Asian lines. So that's the first interpretation. But the most important one is that, well, you read this way because you focus on completing work. So you're only interested in starting new work once your pipeline is relatively free according to your policies and your amount of work in progress. And all that together is what is going to allow you to understand cycle times, which is a little cousin of our lead time, which is basically the time for us to move through all the process or even through pieces 
of our process. So the board is pretty powerful for accountability, for transparency, for effective communication around the work, for sure. And no funny puns and metaphors in here. Not on the board. It's not true. It's not real. There's no other way of reading it. The board is the source of the truth. Refinement then. Another misconception. That meeting that no one knows what needs to happen in that. Who should be there? What happened in the refinement? And yet, throughout the course of the work, yeah, well, it's not done yet. I'm not done yet. I'm not finished. So more often than not, I find that this uh, not done yet uh, will be something related to dependencies. So the board and the prioritization of everything to make sure that this thing gets to done. But many times, I've discovered in, in my experience, a matter of not understanding work properly and yet accepting to do the work was one of the biggest culprits of not done yet. That's definitely an interesting misconception, I think, to approach backlog refinement or backlog grooming, as they used to, to call it. This was introduced heavily around the world with Scrum a while back, but it's a practice. It's not an event, not a meeting, a cadence. It's a practice. And what does that mean, being in practice? A practice does not require a cadence. You are free to do that in whichever way that suits you, suits your team, suits your process. If you need a meeting for it, great. Want to do it just you, the product owner and a senior developer? It's more effective for us this way. Fantastic. The only important thing on a practice and other practices are, for example, pair programming, TDD. So backlog uh, grooming is uh, nothing but that. So the only thing important in a practice is that the end result of the practice is achieved. In the case of refinement, what is that? It's going from boulders to pebbles. It's breaking down the work, the pieces of workable, consumable chunks, prioritization that is done for the upcoming items. It's really that simple. A backlog is uh, in that state in which you can really understand what's coming ahead of time and you kind of can gauge what is doable, what is not. So that definitely make it easier for the team to be able to know, should I accept this work item? Am I ready to accept this work item? It will also make super easy to start it once it's already here and accepted. And we call this being in the ready state. We want to avoid a starting work that does not meet this criteria for successful completion. Work that we already know in one way or another will be blocked. Kanban understands the importance of backlog organization, hence those seven cadences. Weekly replenishment and bi-weekly service re delivery review are great moments to look into upcoming work, but they usually are shorter if you consider sprint planning and sprint review. So I personally, in my usage, I found challenging to discuss those details of whatever needs to be done in a certain amount of a piece of work if what your team does is complex work. If it's not, you know, yeah, we've been doing websites forever, this is yet another website, Great, but if you're really tackling new products all the time, which was the case of, of my experiences, it was really, really hard to use those two cadences there. Sure, you can still talk about upcoming work in the cadences of risk, operational, and uh, strategy review, but considering that they have their own perspective to be taken in, which are risk, operations, and strategy, you might not be left with much time in there. However, ask any Kanban uh, practitioner out there, it is quite possible that most of the understanding of the upcoming work is done through the existing seven cadences is absolutely possible. We can always make them longer as well. However, as a reminder, just like um, a software development team can use DDD, but they don't have to, so they can, you know, use backlog refinement practices, even in Kanban. These practices are not mandatory, but they are also not forbidden. And if your team is in need of understanding their work, by all means, give them a platform for doing just that and call it whatever you like. So backlog refinement, a practice. Um, and I like to remind my folks that the work that's not ready just takes so much longer to get done. It is as simple as that. And then our final misconception, transparency, this elusive little word. Hey, how's it going? The manager comes in, good, progress. Yeah, we're good there. The meaning, the word transparency, I always like to explore uh, the meaning of words when we use them. And transparency is allowing us to see through, not being opaque. So the more you can see things, the better informed decisions you will make, or that's what we think. So can you go ahead and buy a product on a whim? I've done that tons of times at Amazon, but I also found it much, much better and safer when I bought something, knowing the price, reading the specs, 
reviews, you know, sometimes you think it's one size and something else. So seeing the product in action, etc. So let's translate to enterprise life. Let's imagine that all work is visible, the good and the bad. Let's imagine that people are doing the work. The people who do the work are the people talking about it openly, proud of the work they are done and eager for help when they have obstacles. And then you imagine that we find problems early enough we celebrate that finding. We understand the problem, the cause we go ahead, we solve. People talk to each other because that's simply how we just find details about things. Two brains are better than one. Three brains are better than two, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I find really hard to be against this picture, right? This is an ideal Kanban scenario. And if you look here, in the end, all the things that we saw, so Kanban really attempts transparency by keeping a public prioritized backlog. We don't necessarily call it like that, but that's what it is. We describe the workflow in visible steps. We represent the work in that workflow. We have people meet up on specific cadence with a very clear intention. We focus on getting things done. We have the workers explain where the work is at. We measure lead time because we love our customers. We measure throughput because the only work that will count is finished work. But there you go. Kanban is a rather disciplined system to get meaningful work done. But all the steps and all the mechanisms that you will be using, they honestly are not enough if they, if they are implemented halfway or in a company culture where the culture itself, it's not one of transparency. That has nothing to do with Kanban. That has everything to do with the leadership. Having the workers show the work. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? But I see that more often than not, they feel shy. They run away from scrutiny, from showing their work, because what happens is that whatever they want to say will meet a very anxious manager on the other side that not only is not there to solve the problem, but it definitely is there to point the fingers when things are not working, when they feel the pressure. So guess what? In Kanban, that exposure is really intentional. It is key. And in fact, management is welcome in all the cadences, in all the meetings. That is so because they can, you know, anyone, and they are definitely the ones who can help to improve the flow, remove impediments for the flow of work. Anybody who can help should be called in. So there is no, you know, this person should be here. Don't let them hear that. That doesn't exist in Kanban. And if things stall on the board for days or for weeks, managers are really on the line because they're presumably the ones who can help unblock the teams. And everybody has a skin in the game. That's the thing with Kanban. So again, cadences, the board, the backlog, all those are here to ensure the transparency, Transparency is friends with flow. And so there's no running away from those high level of transparency and of exposure in Kanban. There is absolutely no other way. Everybody has a skin in the game. We're more of a Kanban team. Nope, there's no such thing as a Kanban team. Kanban is the method for work effectiveness. It's in the umbrella of Agile. I would even argue there's no such thing as a Scrum team either. Scrum is a framework. Kanban is a method. So you should choose your methods, your frameworks and whatever based on the model of work that you do. So we had a little bit of that chat in the beginning today. So time-based, time box versus flow-based. And the twist is that you can even kind of have a mix in there because it's not a choosing one over the other. That's a little bit more for some other time, a little bit more advanced, but is the QA part of the team? I don't know. In your team composition, is there a QA? Then it is. If not, then they are not, they are part of the overall company process. So they belong to the whole cycle, but not your cycle time. And that's it for, for today. Thank you so much. Bye.